All right, thank you. Yeah, wow, thanks a lot for that uh, overwhelming introduction. And hi and welcome to my talk on service meshed enterprise Java with Kubernetes and Istio. And yeah, my name is Sebastian Deschner, born and raised in uh, Munich, Germany. And do we have some slides here somewhere? Does that work? Probably not. Do we see that on the, no? Oh, there we go. So that's my ASCII arts title, yes. Service Meshed Enterprise Java with Kubernetes and Istio. And a few things about me. Um, I work for this company called IBM, and I do a lot of, well, Java stuff, and enterprise Java and enterprise software in general. And this, um, this very talk is, well, more about why enterprise software um, developers should care about container orchestration, things like Kubernetes and service meshes, such as Istio. So just a quick poll, who of you, well, let's start with who of you knows about Docker or containers? Hands up. Oh, yeah, most of you, okay. So who of you knows about container orchestration, Kubernetes? Oh, okay, that's good. And uh, service meshes, Istio? Things like that, oh, okay, most of you. Okay, that's, that's very nice. So for those of you who don't know that, we, we will get a nice introduction and especially why we should care as enterprise um, developers. Um, so I have a small um, example application for you and you might know um, Obicham Cafeto. So this is why I have an enterprise coffee, um, microservice, quote unquote, examples with at least, well, a minimal microservice example with two applications. One is called coffee shop and the other one is called barista. So as a client, if you want to have some coffee, you go to the coffee shop and you say something like order coffee. And that might be an um, HTTP call, for example, or any boundary trying to call that system. And then now, well, we need some communication. Right, because one application is, is boring, so what we have, we have something like another method start coffee brewing process that might also be a um, synchronous HTTP call for our purposes, and this is, well, how we order some coffee. So a client makes a call that internally ends up in another synchronous call to another system, and then the whole thing goes back. So let's take this very example and, well, have a look at how that would um, look like in a cloud native example with Kubernetes and service meshes and what we need in order to run that in production and so on so, and so forth. All right, slides are boring. boring. Let's go to code a little bit. I have two enterprise Java examples that run on Java EE or slash Jakarta EE, however you want to call it, plus micro profile. I will show where we need, well, which aspects of this that are both deployed to an well, application container, I use Open Liberty, and they are both standalone, running in two individual containers or more. So this is uh, a Maven project, uses Java Enterprise, was built to a WAR file, and just because I'm brave, I deploy this on Java 11. Who of you uses JDK 11 in production? Hands up. <laughs> oh, quite, quite a few. Okay, who of you uses uh, Java 10 or 9? Okay, who of you uses Java 8? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. All right, anyway, let's hope that works out. You know, it's all live coding and everything can go wrong. Um, I quickly want to step a little bit through the code, what our application, specifically the coffee shop, is doing. It's not that much about the Java code, but then we see, you know, what's going on internally. So let's start with the outer HTTP boundary where we want to order some coffee. So I use... Um, REST services, specifically JAXRS. So I have something like an orders resource with, you know, at path orders. So we will end up at something with HTTP slash orders, right? That means we can, for example, use HTTP get to read some orders, HTTP post to post some new coffee orders, right? And how that looks is that we end up in, uh, for example, this method where we want to order some coffee. That means we are posting this Java object, for example, serialized using JSON to this method. And then let's quickly step through the business uh, logic a little bit. We have something um, that is called a coffee shop component where we order the coffee. So that is, for example, uh, this very class where we have, well, a few things going on here, and specifically what we're mainly doing, we go to the other system, the barista system, and we want to start the coffee brewing process. So that means we have something like, you know, again, an HTTP call under the hood. So this barista 
um, class is something like you know, a gateway, an HTTP client. And in our case, it uses JAXRS on the client side as well. And then it will connect to it, and so on and so forth. So that's basically it. And well, now we could actually take that and build this um, application together with the barista application, and then deploy it locally. We can do that, but that's also, well, kind of boring. What we would do instead is actually we want to run that in a Docker container, right? Because later on, we need a cloud-native environment. So a lot of you raised their hand, so you're probably familiar with things like that, a Docker file. That is actually very nice for Java Enterprise if we have things like thin deployment artifacts that plays along very well with the idea how we package applications. So what we need in this case is basically a base image or a, a few base image layers where we have, for example, the application server, the Java installed, some um, potential configuration, things like that. That's all done here. And in the last step, we add our application, like the coffee shop, for example. Or for the, where is it, for the barista application, we can have another one that looks very similar that just deploys the barista. All right, then we could take that Docker file and build a Docker image, and then we can run that Docker image locally. But that's also boring, because we don't want to run it locally, we want to run it in a Kubernetes or service mesh environment. So how does that look like? If you're familiar with Kubernetes, then uh, you might know about, well, how that could roughly look, in a container orchestration environment, what we have, we have this notation of services, specifically Kubernetes services, which are basically abstractions over, well, logical abstractions over applications. So if we have our coffee shop and our barista, then, well, both of them are services. And these services might be backed by one or more running instances that in Kubernetes are called pods, right, which are, in fact, one or more running containers. So that means we have a coffee shop service and then at least one coffee shop pod and a barista service and one barista pod and so on and so forth. And that's going to be deployed. And if the client uh, wants to access the coffee shop, it does so using the service and will end up at one of the running instances. And then if that main container, if our application accesses another system, it also does so uh, while using the service and will end up at, at an instance. So that means we will have also the notation for our Kubernetes deployment. So how does that look? I have some YAML for you. Who of you likes the, who of you knows the YAML uh, file format? And who of you likes the YAML file format? Hands up. Oh, at least a few of you. Yeah, we will talk. So what we have, we basically define how our Kubernetes resources look like. So I told you about, you know, we have services and pods and things like that. The nice story, just like in Docker, we have declarative ways of defining what we want to have, what we want to have in our application, what our environment should look like. So we don't have to go and programmatically or you know, manually do things in our cluster. We literally specify how, how the world should look like and then just throw these resources against our cluster, and it will do so. So that means for a service, we just specify how that service should look like. For the coffee shop, that's, well, quite basic, it just has a name, mainly, and how our uh, pods should look like. A pod is not usually not created directly, but um, done so using a deployment. A deployment is, again, an abstraction over our pods because it can manage these pods. So if we say we want one replica or two replicas or 10 replica, then we can do so, and it will just manage these pods for us and create more instances and can scale up and down and can deploy new versions and a few other things. So that's basically how that works in, the, in a Kubernetes environment. All right, so then what we need is basically a Kubernetes cluster, and then we can apply all these things. Let's do this. So here's the website if you want to check that out, kubernetes.io. And well, it's meant to be production grade, and there are a lot of things to be said about that. And then we need some cluster. You can take either a mini cube or some local installation on your laptop, or you can uh, use one of the managed uh, versions out there. I use the uh, IBM Cloud for managed Kubernetes. You can take whatever you like, whatever Kubernetes is supported for you. And then if you connect that, you will end up with some uh, cluster connection that you can um, access via kube control. So for example, we can say kube control 
get and then you know the resource type get services or get parts and as you can see there is nothing on the cluster it's basically empty so that is a kubernetes cluster that i have it's running in frankfurt somewhere in the cloud and i can access this now and i can deploy my coffee shop and barista because i finally can order some coffee all right let's do this i have some resources defined here some yaml files i apply the for the coffee shop and the barista deployment and then what i have i have two services coffee shop and barista that have just been created and i hopefully also have pods for mainly barista and coffee shop and they're currently starting up that means well i need to wait until my application is up and running we have some probes that we can define so in, um, in order to make sure that kubernetes knows when our application is ready things like that and then we can go and hopefully finally order some coffee there is one question that you might have and this is basically what we didn't talk about yet is how does well this arrow find the other instance how does it find the barista service right because we might have multiple services and what you typically do in enterprise applications that you have to you know configure ip addresses right how do you find my barista backend my barista backend in integration in test might be different from production right so i need to configure this well luckily i don't because how that looks like and you might have seen that before this is the url that i use in order to access my barista application and in the host name i literally write barista plus the port 9080 which is the default port for liberty but whatever why can i do this well this works because kubernetes does a cluster internal dns resolution for all the service names which is very helpful for us so that means it doesn't matter in which environment we're in we might have you know staging environment test environment production environment we can always just specify please give us any barista instance and what kubernetes will do it will dns resolve that for us and we will end up at one of the running instances of the barista application in this case so we can literally hard code this url and just access it and we don't have to change or reconfigure anything depending on the environment which is a very nice feature i believe all right now that is up and running let's finally order some coffee what we can do use any http client on the command line for example curl to access this application and then i will use some black magic to get the ip address of my cluster and i can write coffee shop which is the default context uh, root for my application plus resources you might have seen that as the default for jaxrs and then we have things like orders for example and then if i'm lucky i get 200 okay and an empty json array because well it's stored in memory so there's no order in the system yet all right cool now again let's order some coffee so what i have to do i basically have to post some object here which well looks like follows i have a coffee order and it has a bunch of things and mainly it has a coffee order type so that means i have a drink type let's do this post some application json and then we have some oh no, it's over there we have some json here for example the type and then i have for example cappuccino or espresso let's do some espresso all right yes good let's order that and then if we're lucky yes it works and it says 201 created that new coffee order has been created in the system and then hopefully it's in the system yeah that looks good all right so that is now in the system that means well it worked right and that means also the communication inside the mesh worked apparently because if we look in our code apparently that was called in a synchronous way we have one thread running through that code that i just showed you and we end up at a client and if we look at our diagram it's the same happening here we make a synchronous request but now the point is is that ready for production no <laughs> well maybe not we might need a few more things and that's the, that's the point we might care about a few more concerns when we're running applications in production for example observability we have no clue what's going on here other than that i just ordered a coffee and thankfully it was in the system but we don't know which was actually you know being called what what uh, is going on in our system and a few other things for example resiliency what happens if something goes wrong and that is the reason why the whole thing what i deployed to is actually 
not only Kubernetes clusters, so, but I have a service mesh environment on this very cluster that I showed you. And specifically, I'm using Istio. So Istio is a service mesh technology, and a service mesh is, well, basically a mesh of interconnected microservice deployments where I can enhance the deployments, the implementations, with a few more concerns that I need in production without actually changing the application on the implementation level. That means I can add a few more concerns in an aspect-oriented way, if you want. Concerns such as observability, resiliency, some more advanced traffic routing, and a few other things that I want to show you. So one thing we can actually add, or another way that comes out of the box, is, for example, monitoring. We can actually see what happens in our system. And in order to do that, let me order a little bit more coffee, that we actually have something going on in our system. More coffee, more coffee, more coffee. Let's do this. And what I have out of the box, I have this system using Grafana. I think my, did that break down? No, that works. And specifically, what is this Grafana? What you just saw, I hope it, let's run this again. Sometimes the port forwarding doesn't quite work if you change, yeah, if you change the network. So Grafana is a monitoring um, technology, an open source solution that ships with Istio if you enable it. So I did not set that up, yet you can read Barista or coffee shop. Again, I did not configure that. That comes out of the box and discovers all the services that we have in our service mesh. And now what we can see, some technical metrics. For the coffee shop service, we have you know these and that, request durations for the clients. We have so and so many request volumes, success rate, and you know the workload that comes from here and there. We also have the barista service. And we see, oh, there's some traffic going on in that system. And actually, we can even see where that traffic is coming from from the coffee shop. So now we can see, oh, we actually have some traffic from the coffee shop calling the barista service, and we see what is going on inside the service mesh, out of the box without you know, any effort on our side, without configuration effort. What else is there for observability is this cute little guy with the German name Jäger, <laughs> means hunter. That is a distributed tracing technology. and that can trace actually individual requests where we can find some individual requests. Okay, let me restart this again. Kigali, Jäger, I think that was due to the, yeah. Um, individual requests that fly through the system and then we can actually see, okay, through which individual instances did a particular request go through. So let's take this for example and then we can see, oh, this is actually a synchronous request. Right, that goes into, well, Ingress Gateway, that is basically the entrance into a cluster, and goes into the coffee shop, and then ends up at, well, the barista system. And here we can even have a look at the individual request and see, okay, that's a HTTP put request for, well, this URL, oops, um, looks familiar, that is the barista uh, backend URL. And we can see what is going on. So that is especially helpful to debug some situations where, well, well we want to see which um, communication we have in our system. Another helpful thing is this one, oh, login, <laughs> Kiali, which is a service graph technology. So, well, admittedly, this is kind of boring. You see this arrow from one to the other to the other. We see which, well, communication is going on in the multiple services that we have and the instances of these. So, or we can even have some fancy traffic animation. That's the best part. So we can see which communication we currently have. And this also sh only shows the active communication, what is currently going on. And, well, that's kind of boring, but imagine if you have a more sophisticated example with more services and more communication going on, then you can have a quite good overview what is actually happening, which services and which systems communicate with uh, which others. So that's a very helpful um, technology as well. Uh, Kiali actually knows about Istio, so it's aware of the configuration that we'll show you in a second, so we can see a little bit more of that. Okay, so these are a few examples on the observability side that Istio provides us out of the box. Now, you might ask yourself, 
how does all of that black magic work, right? Without changing anything. I mean, my application still runs plain Java Enterprise. I mean, I, I showed you the, the Palm XML. There's nothing hidden here, right? It's Java E, well, plus some micro profile additions, but that's basically it. That's what I'm running here. But how do all these additions um, come from? So what we have in a service mesh, and again, I showed you this was actually a service mesh environment, is that we have for each and every pod, for each and every instance that is running, is not only one container, but two containers with a so-called proxy sidecar container deployed alongside, alongside of the main application that we have. So for the coffee shop service, we have one pod here, and the pod has well, the main container and the proxy container. And now, if we have some communication going on, what actually happens if we call the coffee shop, the request will end up at the proxy. And then the proxy will or might forward the request to the main container. And then the same is true if the main container uh, communicates to some other application uh, part of the mesh, then it will also go through the proxy, end up at the other proxy, and that will then call our application and the same thing back. And now you can imagine, well, if all of these proxies are part of the communication, then they will basically see everything that's going on communication-wise in our mesh, and also they have the full control over what's going on, since they literally sit in the middle. So then what we, uh, what we can do, we have a thing called control plane with a few components where we can actually control these um, under the hoods, it's uh, envoy proxies that sit there and then the control plane well, distributes all their configuration and makes sure that they you know, behave how they should and uh, will scrape all the um, necessary information out of that. So this is how you get to the monitoring data and you know, to all of the other information. The Envoy proxies will literally um, emit that information. Make sense? Well, maybe. One more thing that's actually lacking, distributed tracing again. How do we know, even with all of that observability going on, that these two requests are correlated? Just because they happen to happen at the same time? Well, the answer for that is we need some correlation IDs. Right? If you're into distributed tracing, that's well, quite kind of old stuff. We need some, for example, HTTP headers with correlation IDs that are being passed from one request to the other request so that later on we can see, okay, actually one request originated from the other request in a synchronous way, right? Because now you would have to know that our application actually has a synchronous request thread that goes through the system and ends up at the client that then calls the other system, that the whole thing is synchronous. How does that work? Well, you can actually have a look at the um, documentation in Istio. What we would need to do is go to our resource, to our boundary, to the starting point, look at the HTTP request and say, oh, the HTTP request has a few headers, right? With open tracing or open zipkin, you might have uh, had a look at it. It's like X-B3, span ID, trace ID. These are the names of these headers in um, zipkin or Jaeger. And then we would take these headers store them, either in something like a thread local or some other black magic, or actually take them here, pass them as parameters at this method, pass them here, pass them here, you see where this is going, then take the header information and then add them again, right? Otherwise, you would not have this information. All right, well, this is kind of cumbersome, and luckily, we don't have to do that. What we can do instead, and this is very helpful, we can use um, a microprofile extension or a microprofile project called Open Tracing. So what microprofile Open Tracing does, if we activate it, we don't even have to use the API in the Maven Palm XML. It just has to be you know, active on the uh, server side. Uh, what I do for this case, for example, show the barista one. I show, oops, my Open Liberty configuration. So I like Open Liberty because it um, supports both Java Enterprise and MicroProfile, and you can actually write up and use applications that mix and match both standards or both you know, platforms, if you want, both ecosystems. And then you can use things like you know, CDI, JAXRS, whatever, and MicroProfile Open Tracing, plus, um, well, that's uh, Open Liberty specific, 
um, an implementation that then makes sure, and this is the nice part, without doing anything on the um, code side, that then makes sure if we have a JAX-RS resource and if we have a Zipkin-enabled HTTP request, you know, one with these headers, then it will take that and store it in the current uh, context and go through you know, the, re uh, the synchronous request uh, thread. And if it then ends up at a client, an AJAX-RS client, it will automatically take these headers and pass it to the client request for the next system. And this is why this actually works, that we have, well, this connection here, that we know that one request originated from the other. So that's a very uh, helpful extension at this point, so we don't have to change anything on our code side. That's good. All right. Now, that's enough to be said about observability on that side. What else might we need in production that actually service mesh, meshes enable for us? We might need, well, some more resiliency. So what happens if actually the barista system becomes unavailable if that is down, right? Or, luckily, in our barista, we define some timeout. What happens if our implementation does not define, you know, some timeout and then, you know, something else breaks in between and um, this one doesn't work and so on and so forth? Well, the proxies can actually mitigate a few situations and then handle some timeouts, for example, and respond to our actual application to the calling application with an appropriate HTTP error, for example. So this is, um, this is uh, possible here to implement. And for that, I will show you the Istio resources for the barista and the coffee shop. So if you know a little bit about Kubernetes and if you have seen these nice YAMLs, I have some more YAML for you. This is how you define Istio resources. We had some services and some deployments. Now we have a, something called virtual service and destination rule. What is that? A virtual service in Istio is, well, a set of r uh, rules that we apply for a service that is part of the service mesh. So these are basically the errors that we define here. And in this case, it's, well, quite boring, quite default, quite simple. Everything that we um, call uh, for the barista host will actually end up at the barista host. Okay. Subset v1. Okay. And we have a destination rule. A destination rule um, adds some or specifies some further policies at a destination. For example, who is even allowed to call this and so on and so forth. And it defines some subsets where I can well, further split up the service implementations that I have for a particular service and might have you know, some subset versions of that. Um, I will point you to some more resources. I know this is a very basic introduction now to the whole Istio stuff that's actually quite complex, a lot of uh, things that you can do here um, where you can learn a little bit more about it. So the nice story about that is actually how that is being used is that in Istio, well, you know about kube control get services maybe, kube control and Kubernetes can be used in a quite um, straightforward fashion to get information um, of specific resource types, right? The good story about Istio is that it actually uses an extension of Kubernetes. So if you use plain Kubernetes, it does not know about virtual services, what that is. But if you have a cluster that is enabled for that, you can actually say things like, kubectl, give me the virtual services. So you can extend that for these types, and this is what Istio does. So good news for us is the look and feel, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, of Istio is very much the same. You can use the same kube control commands and so on and so forth. You can write the YAML, you know, you see it looks very similar, and so on and so forth. All right, let's live code YAML a little bit, just because we are brave, and you tell me if I make some mistakes. So this is the virtual service for the coffee shop. The other one, the coffee shop is also available from the outside, so it has a thing like a gateway that is quite similar to Kubernetes ingress. It basically allows some ingress traffic inside our clusters and binds it to also you know, this virtual uh, service for you know, the service definition of the coffee shop. So that again says, well, everything here ends up at the coffee shop destination subset v1. Okay, great. So what we can do, for example, for resiliency, I can add some, well, there are a few uh, examples what I can do. I can add some timeout here. 
So I can go and say, this route, this error in my diagram should now define some timeout behavior that is implemented in the proxy. So if whatever you do, that request takes longer than one second, you know, make sure that a timeout happens and an appropriate HTTP response. Okay. So who said, again, they like YAML? So what I dislike about YAML, how do you know whether this is correct? Or this is correct? Or maybe this is correct? No, actually, this is correct. Somebody once said, in order to write YAML, you have to take a ruler for your a screen and place it there and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is correct. <laughs> okay, perfect. So if this is correct, then let's apply it. Coffee shop, deployment, routing. And then, yeah, it works, <laughs> right? Well, we don't know. Obviously, it doesn't take longer than one second, but how do we know that this resiliency actually works? Well, we have to slow it down, right? So what we could do in order to test that resiliency and a few other things is, well, we could redeploy our application, the barista application, to make that a little bit slower, to basically say, okay, now we change something here to respond in two seconds instead of one. Well, then we have to redeploy it and things like that. Actually, what is quite helpful, another nice feature, that we can use these proxies also for testing purposes and mess things up. Make requests slower, make requests randomly fail, just because we can, in order to test the resiliency of the service mesh or of our application. So what we can do for test purposes, please don't do that in production, is to take another arrow and say, hey, by the way, you should now be faulty. So let's introduce some faults, if I could type. For example, we can add a delay. For example, a fixed delay of three seconds, but not all the time, but only in 50% um, of the cases. Right? Oh, perfect. Ready for production, that code. OK, let's apply this. Barista deployment. And then what happens if we apply that? Well, by any chance, either our, respond immedi uh, our response immediately works, or, well, we have to wait not three seconds, but one second until that timeout fires, and then we get here HTTP um, gateway timeout response. That now is being applied or being guarded by that first proxy, by that first arrow. Okay, that's one example of what we can do, among a few other things. Um, for example, we can add some uh, outlier detection, we can have some um, circuit breakers and things like that, all on a connection and networking base level. Um, but that is basically being implemented by, by these service mesh proxies. OK, let's roll this back. So that's a nice feature of that. Another very helpful feature of service mesh in general is traffic management. So if we actually change something from the default route, how, well, things are being accessed here. So for example, I already showed you the subset feature. We might have some cases where we say, oh, in this case, even though if you specify barista, do not end up at the barista service, or maybe not at this service, but at another instance, right? So we could reroute things on a service mesh level, so on the Istio proxies, without even you know, changing anything in our application or um, on the Kubernetes level. So that is helpful if we want to have some more advanced deployment scenarios, or things like A-B testing, or canary releases. So what we can do, for example, say, well, this is quite nice that we always end up at this very application version, but let's say we want to have an A-B testing where a specific subset of your users go to a different version based on you know, any information that you find in the HTTP request, for example, headers. So what we could do, now it's getting interesting, um, live code YAML, we can actually match requests based on all the information that we have in HTTP level, for example, HTTP headers, and say, for example, we might have some HTTP headers, such as the user agent, and then based on regex, whether it's, you know, let's say, Firefox browser, please take this and, well, route it differently. So route that to, for example, subset v2 instead. Does it work? Did I make some mistakes? You check it. Otherwise, it's your fault, too, if it doesn't work. Who said they, they like YAML? <laughs> nice. 
So what we have to do is define another subset, uh, V2, right? So then we have two different versions of our subset. Okay, how does this work? Where does the second version come from? Well, as you can see, we define a version with a name and we have some label. Label version so and so. Where does the label come from? Well, actually from the deployment. We have some label app coffee shop and another one version V1. And of course, I have another deployment that you might have seen, version V2, that has a different image and reacts a little bit differently. So that works. We have different instances running here, actually. You can see them. We have coffee shop and coffee shop V2. And they have different labels. So this is why this works. OK. And then, if we apply this, control apply um, coffee shop deployment, then, well, first of all, we don't see any change. But what we can do, we can, for example, curl um, this one and ask for, well, the espresso here. So this is, again, just what we had before. This is always the same response with all the coffee orders that we ordered. But now, if I do this request with a header, such as user agent Firefox, then, well, we end up with a different response that's actually empty because that system has not been used yet, right? Okay, let's change this as well. Let's um, create some coffee again with some espresso, right? And another one. And now, if we ask this, well, now this is the response of the second system that only is valid for Firefox users. And you can see this also response a little bit differently with a hypermedia uh, response instead of just the um, ID, stuff like that. If we do the same thing without a user agent or without, uh, with a different agent, then we end up at the other response. So that's about it. Now we can control this based on you know, any information, in this case, the HTTP header. That's about A-B testing and how you can implement that. Another thing is canary releases. Well, we can, for example, say, well, for testing purposes or in order to test a new rollout in our continuous delivery approach, let's say we do not do a Big Bang deployment, but we route 5% of the traffic to the new version first. And then we might increase that traffic right, to 10%, 25 whatever. So that is also possible that we literally um, randomly take a different destination V2, and then we have a weight assigned to that, either 50-50 or let's say 70-30. And we have multiple destinations in this route, and then, you know, by chance, randomly, we route to one or the other. So in this case, that's a different approach here. Then we can say, okay, now actually we can get rid of the header again. We end up at either this or that response. Of course, that's a good way of random. It never works, right, when in demos. So depending on that, we end up at either one or the other. All right, that's to be said about um, these ways of routing things. Again, this was now very manual and, you know, live coding YAML, so a lot of things that can go wrong. In a project, you would typically not do this, especially manually, right? What we would do instead is to build some automation around it. So, for example, with these advanced deployment approaches, where we say, as part of our continuous delivery approach, we want to have, you know, we want to use the traffic management features of our service mesh to reroute the traffic accordingly and to then, you know, increase the traffic volume. We want to automate this. We want to have an approach where that is being done. Okay. There is some technology uh, out there to do that. Let's um, delete this, what I had so far, so I can show you a different approach. But I have some basic example of a canary approach that does a similar thing, but in a more advanced and sophisticated way. Um, coffee shop deployment canary. Uh, again, you will find all these resources later on that I provide to you. Uh, what we have here, let's deploy uh, version one uh, first. So what I have is I have some template that basically, well, creates these resources based on, well, some criteria. So take this subset version and take so and so many uh, percent of the traffic and then reroute it accordingly. So what I did, 
um, I have now a part. Watch this. Yeah, that is now being deployed. Okay, so that doesn't. Um, coffee, coffee shop deployment canary. Nope. And what I can do is I can um, curl the health check actually. So what the health check does, I include some application version. I can show it to you here. That is my health check resource that comes with micro profile health check. And I can add some you know, data. For example, the application version, that is now version v1. So what I can show you with that is, well, now I have version v1. I just issue a lot of requests, and it's always version v1, until I actually, well, say I want to deploy a new canary release of, well, a different version. So old subset is v1, and then the new subset is v2 with application version v2. And what this script is doing, well, it does this automated approach of saying, OK, I want a canary release and not a Big Bang deployment. So what I do, I deploy a Kubernetes deployment v2 first and just wait until that is up and running, which happens right now. So that is being deployed, and we just wait until that is ready. And then what will happen is that we take these Istio resources, what I just showed you, the same thing, and say, OK, now we have subset v1 and v2. Now fire up 5% so of the traffic and 95 then 10%, and so on and so forth. This is what happens right now. So it applies that. And as you can see on the left side with uh, the response, we get, well, we get uh, mostly ones, but then more and more we will get version 2 when we ask uh, for, uh, for the specific uh, version here, and that will gradually increase until well, all of it is being rolled out. And at the same time, also in an automated approach, what you should have is, of course, the monitoring in, in place. So there is uh, what we have, coffee shop, for example. We can see the version coming here with version well, v1, and then gradually we ramp up version v2. And at the same time, well, you should have a look at the monitoring that's happening, and of course at the arrows, because that is the whole point. If you do this approach, why do we do it? Well, we roll out something to production in order to mitigate, to minimize the impact for our users. Because if the new version doesn't work and immediately crashes and burns, what happens is that now you only impact 5% of the user. Right? And if then the monitoring detects that this you know, version is completely faulty, you can also automatically roll back and make sure you know, that whole impact is not that big. And as we can see here, yeah, now it's fully rolled out, and we only have version 2 up and running. So that is basically that is one example of such an automated approach, how that might look like. Of course, included with monitoring and some you know, rollback strategies. And by doing so, you get more and more of safer how you roll out um, your application. And, um, specifically in a continuous delivery approach. All right, that's about to be said for uh, traffic management. There are many, many other things um, that we can implement using such, um, such a service mesh technology. So basically, what we have, again, to, to um, go back to the whole communication part, is that we can enhance all of the communication that happens inside this cluster, inside our service mesh, on a well, HTTP or on a uh, communication level. So most of that, what I'm showing you, is supported for HTTP communication. In general, it's available for you know, on principle. In uh, per principle, it's available for all um, uh, communication protocols that are not encrypted, right? So that the proxies af actually have a chance to well see what's going on here, and of course, to also control and you know do things differently, because for the HTTP. Uh, requests, well, it knows about the HTTP protocol, and this is why we can actually um, have a look at all the information here. And then, well, depends what uh, other technologies you're using. So again, for uh, Grafana here, for example, you see if it's anything else, then, well, it supports TCP, but then you don't see that many, uh, that many information, right? So with databases or with uh, some other protocols. Um, that's a question what you want to use in this case. Um, what is quite helpful that for typical HTTP uh, communication, it supports a lot of things out of the box, specifically with regards to uh, observability and resiliency and uh, traffic management, for example. The other things that are out there, um, security and um, control, so you can have mutual TLS. 
uh, with encrypted uh, communication between the services with the same example that I showed you. So I'm only using HTTP right, without the S, plain unencrypted. But even so, what you can do, you can encrypt the traffic between these proxies and with the outgoing as well as the incoming encryption, you can also encrypt all of the traffic that enters or leaves the cluster. So that's also possible. Why would we do that? Well, it makes things actually simpler on the application level side so that the implementations don't have to care about the encryption that is being done by the proxies. And it even makes it more secure because then in our cluster, in the control plane, we can actually use, well, a different component to handle these certificates. So then we can issue certificates for individual service instances, and then we can actually make sure that a particular service might call another service or not, because that uh, actually can be checked via the encryption if that is um, encrypted um, asymmetrically. So these are a few other things that you can, can do with, well, mutual TLS in this case, and with that, approach of having a sidecar proxy container that basically proxies um, all the communication. So if you're interested a little bit more into that, what I can um, show you, you will get all the resources there. That's all on GitHub. I'll provide a link. I also um, recorded um, some uh, video that I can just uh, watch on this networking API because honestly, I had quite some well, difficulties to wrap my head around the whole virtual services and destination rules, gateways, service entries, and a lot of other um, resources that you have, because, well, most of us are Java developers, right? And this whole cloud native stuff might not necessarily come natural to us. So um, I think some more uh, guidance might be, uh, might be helpful here. But I think this is a very interesting topic for the future of uh, of enterprise projects because, well, at some point, if you think about whole DevOps movement and the idea that somebody who writes an application also is responsible how to run that application later on, then we just need to care about you know, how to run this in production, how to do things like traffic management, rollout strategies, observability, things like that. And such technology only enables us to do so without doing all these things manually, right? Same thing like with containers or container orchestration. All these technologies are not necessarily new, right? Like DNS resolution out there for, you know, forever. But now we have a more, more sophisticated approach how to do that in an automated way, in a descriptive way, with declarative infrastructure as code formats, right? Docker files, YAML files, things like that. And then we can just make sure that our technology applies these things for us and we're a little bit more efficient in our daily work and can do this well, in a more pragmatic way. So as some key takeaways for container orchestration, first of all, Kubernetes. Only Kubernetes part that orchestrates our Docker containers in our cluster. What do they provide us? Well, service discovery, for example, what we've seen well, with this uh, DNS resolution here inside uh, the service, um, the service cluster or the whole Kubernetes cluster, which is quite powerful. Of course, the whole distribution and load balancing part of if we have multiple instances of coffee shop, barista, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, the whole networking part and configuration. So if you ever deploy Docker containers manually and set up the whole you know, Docker network, IP addresses of multiple hosts, and so on and so forth, with IP tables and forwarding and blah, blah, you know that this is actually quite some work, which is done with the or container orchestration for us. And deployment, scal scalability, we can scale up and down, again, in a declarative approach that is quite helpful. For service meshes, a few well key takeaways or why we might be interested in these. Service meshes transparently add some concerns that we might need when we run our application in production. Cross-cutting concerns such as you know, resiliency, traffic management, observability, um, authentication, authorization, what I showed you. And think of them as um, somebody said, which I think is a quite good uh, analogy, AOP, aspect-oriented programming, but for applications. Because we do actually a very similar thing if we write Java, such as Java Enterprise or Spring or any declarative uh, API, we write something, our business logic in Java, right? We define a class, 
and then we just add some annotations, right? And just by doing so, well, we make some HTTP endpoint or some database transaction handling, and we make sure that the implementation does a few more aspects, a few more things, by just declaratively, declaratively um, um, specifying them. And now that's the same way for you know, that service mesh technology. And I think it integrates very well with the approach of Java Enterprise, because it was always the case that in our application, we care about business logic, right? We write our business logic in Java, and the whole implementation, things like HTTP handling, transactions, databases, and whatnot, we don't care about that in our you know, Java code. That is being implemented in a different lower level that typically is the application server or application container or whatever you have. And now this approach, well, takes this approach a little bit further and say we also now have a few more concerns that are now, in this case, implemented by the environment. And actually, this enables us to care more about what we should care about as developers that is implementing business logic in Java. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much for your attention.